So hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Deborah Veloma, and I'm professor and chair of the textiles program. And I want to welcome everybody to the spring 2021 BFA senior presentations, conversations. And I want to begin today with a land acknowledgement. Um, California College of the Arts campuses are located on Huchin and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively on the unceded territories of Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon the indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present and future here and around the world and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you're unsure of whose land you're currently residing on, we encourage you to do that research and find out who the first peoples were on the land you live. So a few housekeeping uh, details. This event is being recorded and it will be posted publicly for those who are unable to attend. So if you're not comfortable with your name or face appearing, please delete your name and close your cameras. Um, we'll be moving pretty quickly and smoothly through the uh, presentations. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the attendees to ask questions, but we do um, encourage you to put into the chat any comments or questions or affirmations for the students who are presenting and those will be saved and delivered to the students themselves. So they'll be able to read them later. I want to introduce our, um, our um, respondents today. We're very, very lucky to have Lydia Matthews uh, who is joining us all the way from Athens, Greece. Um, she's a longtime colleague and friend of mine and she also taught at CCA some years ago. She was very instrumental at the college. Lydia is currently a Brooklyn and Athens-based independent curate, curator, writer, cultural activist, and professor. She teaches in the fine arts program at Parsons and is the founding director of the curatorial design research lab in the new school. She's also, she's also a, um, sorry for that interruption. Um, She's also a board member of the American Craft Council. She's trained in contemporary and modern art history and her work uh, explores how contemporary artists, artisans and designers foster critical democratic debates and intimate community interactions in the public sphere, often in response to a variety of urgent global and local conditions. Lydia publishes and lectures internationally on socially engaged art, craft, design, her curatorial projects in New York, the post-Soviet region, Turkey and Southern Europe include gallery and museum exhibitions, participatory events, community-based urban festivals, and multi-interdisciplinary pedagogical exchanges addressing ecological and social sustainability. So I hope everybody welcomes Lydia warmly. And our second respondent is Catherine Hamilton. And Catherine is an outstanding dual degree graduate student in the curatorial practice and visual critical studies programs at CCA. During her time here at school, she's worked for the CCA exhibitions office, served as a gallery director of CCA's graduate exhibition space, Play Space, and is currently one of the two founding editors of the CCA publication, Rewind, Respond, Review. So with that in mind, um, our schedule will start. We have five students who will be presenting today, each for 10 minutes. And then the respondents will also have 10 minutes to offer any comments about their work. Um, and I, from, on a personal note, I'm very proud to present these five students. These are amazing young artists. And I've been working with them through the semester very closely in a senior projects class. They have been working very hard towards the development of a cohesive body of work that's the culmination of their four years of study. Each is unique in their own areas of inquiry and making. And I wanna tell them personally that it's been my pleasure to get to know each and every one of you. 
and to help guide you through your final semester. So each student will introduce themselves um, and we will begin with Shanti, our first presenter. Thank you everybody. I will share my screen. Can all see this? Okay, great. Hello, my name is Shanti Moriano Freire. I am a textiles artist and today I will be sharing Mis Colores thesis work with you. I would like to start off with a quote that hits home for me and has accompanied my making for the last two years. Rupi Kaur is a poet, artist, and performer. She immigrated with her family from India to Canada at the age of four. So how dare you mock your mother when she opens her mouth and broken English spills out. Her accent is thick like honey. Hold it with your life. It's the only thing she has left from home. Don't stomp on that richness. Inspired by image making with words, my statement shares the journey of finding my colors in my gringa Latina reality. Focusing on the brilliance that has been passed down to me by the strong unapologetic women in my life, my abuelita, my mom, and my sister. This is for them. When she spoke, her English sounded different from her sister's. And when her mom spoke to her in Spanish, she replied in English. The white was everywhere she went, on the houses with their American flags, on the perfect porcelain plates, the pale faces with blue eyes, a drought of color, no room for the mixed and matched Goodwill placemats her mother had bought, no room for the maduros fritos her mom packed for lunch, no room for her colores to grow. Parched, but she didn't know it until the colores seeped through her veins. The flores radiating fuchsia, houses were verdes, anaranjadas, even amarillas. Fruit grew on árboles like they did in Ecuador. Suddenly, Favorita strength of Rojo Brillante soaked her eyes. The rhythm of her mom's orange platforms saturated her ears, dancing to Celia Cruz. Her sister's radiating green dress bringing her warmth on the coldest winter day. Yellow tears glistened down her cheeks. She looked up and felt the warm brilliance of her magical roots. Salsa music was my lullaby and alarm clock most of my life. It was a crucial piece my family carried with them from Ecuador and ingrained in me. The Cecilia Cruz, who was a legendary salsa singer from Cuba, she formed part of the record label Fania All Stars, which was home to many iconic salsa artists. Music and lyrics are of fundamental materials in my practice. Reading has become a big facet of my making and the need to learn more about my Latin American history as well as narratives that have experienced the fine dance of what it's like to be culturally in an in-between space. Gloria Anzaldúa's book, Borderlands, tackles this topic from different aspects, especially within language, um, which has always fascinated me, the morphing of English and Spanish. David Batchelor's Chromophobia was a revolutionary read as he describes the villainous role colors play in Western society. This journey began with the first embroidered life-size Abuelita portrait. My grandmother is the color red because all of my life she has worn red lipstick, painted her nails red, and worn red door perfume by Elizabeth Arden. In his book, Bachelor mentions our particular kind of white, a kind of white that is not created by bleach, but that itself is bleach. Growing up in the frozen landscape of Minnesota, my eyes started to only accept the blinding white and that reality, which I so yearn to be part of. Because the bleach I was dealing with saw me as an inferior hue, I couldn't be bleached. The asphyxiation of this space began to drain my brightly pigmented being and exile the existence of the brown women in my life. It rewired my brain to only accept sanitized forms of seeing the world. After discovering the invasion of white in me and unearthing the beauty of my colors I've inherited, it was urgent to look at my lineage and collaborate with them because they have so generously passed down colors to me. I wanted them to see that their insistence in bringing pieces of Ecuador with them so that I could know my roots was achieved, that they warmed me when I was frozen. This is the revamped Abuelita portrait. 
Since working during this last year has been difficult to say the least, I started by working digitally. It was important for me that every visual decision was based on stories or characteristics that embody who they are. My grandmother would sing to me stories of heartbreak where the characters were gardenias and then would shift to share her stories of childhood by painting scenes of her time at sea in my head made up of many shades of blue and happiness. This is the color palette that was born from the collage and it was important for me to name the colors because it adds richness to the narratives of each woman. In my grandmother's case, because she has dementia, these titles were taken from memories my mother, sister, and I have of her. The light blue titled Guayaquileño Madera de Guerrero, meaning warrior made of lumber, brings me back to the moment where she sensed I was scared and started singing this to me. My mother is a force. She is spontaneous and independent. When we immigrated to the US, she maintained her vivacious personality. She manifested color literally with her clothes and her green eyeshadow, which at this time was distressing, but now I appreciate. The color names for my mom and sister stem from me interviewing them on their favorite songs, songs that represent them or remind them of Ecuador. My favorite one of this palette is called Arquitecta, meaning architect, which is not a song, but when we go to Ecuador, her colleagues refer to her as that. And I found pride in it because in our US reality, when people look at my mom's cinnamon skin, her makeup and her style, their eyes don't comprehend her vibrant primary colors. For me, it's a reminder of her brilliance and the sacrifice she made in order to propel her kids forward. Maria is my sister. We are 18 years apart and have a mom-sister relationship. She is my soulmate. She paved the road to navigating this new life. She immigrated before us and has been through it all, yet her compassion and generosity has never faded. To me, she is grounding. Recently, she took an ancestry test and found out that she is mostly indigenous and has radiated that pride which lies in the peaks and valleys of the Andes Mountains. The color me pare, me pare, meaning I stood up, I stood up, is who she is. I cannot tell you the amount of time she has been knocked down, but every day she showed up in her beaming green to break down barriers. The last generation is me. It was important for me to incorporate motifs that were in previous portraits to complete the narrative of what I've been passed down and how it has helped me grow my own primary colors. The pink in this palette sums up the journey of being multicultural and is called goes from south to north and from one side of myself to the other. Realizing my preference for working in larger scale combined with needing to add more detail to each portrait called for finding a new medium to support the scale and timeline. Tufting is something I discovered this past winter and has been a great way of achieving embroidery-esque work. This is a picture of one of the dragon fruits in my sister's portraits that I've tufted. My next steps are to physically make each portrait um, and the end result will be life size. I would like each member to be printed on fabric and then put them on their tufted backgrounds. Setting parameters for how colors function in my practice is something I focus on and is adapted depending on the concept. Colors are drawn out from images I have taken myself if that aligns with a concept or are gathered from a final piece and then given names to add depth to the narrative. I would like to thank my family again for their collaboration and support throughout my college career and life. The Yanish Calicchio family for being my second home base in California my partner Nathaniel for being my right hand, the friendships I've made along the way, and the textiles department and faculty members that have seen me grow and shape the artist I am. Thank you all for coming and letting me share my work. Wow, that was <clears throat> quite extraordinary, Shanti. Thank you so much for a really uh, beautiful presentation, um, visually stunning one, uh, and also one that uh, operates on on so many levels at once. I, um, you know, as I was um, listening to you, I was 
thinking a lot about the way you were using the language as well as the ways that you were using color and textiles ultimately. But I appreciated the fact um, that you were welcoming a kind of poetics into the, uh, the statement and also uh, that you were, you were really welcoming a kind of slippage between English and Spanish uh, in the words and in the ways in which um, placing them on the page is also and saying them out loud is also a sort of affirming um, everybody's, uh, you know, biculturalism, if you will, because um, that there is a, a way in which even if you isolated a word, you might not um, understand it, but in the way that you use it, there's a fluidity that makes you realize uh, how, how much um, of, a, of a fluid relationship there is between those languages uh, and how much richer it is to, to, uh, to play between the two. So I appreciated that in the, in the language that you used. Um, and also the, the multi-sensory components of your work. Uh, I was really struck by how many senses you engaged, um, not only in terms of the eye, um, but also your uh, tribute to music and your incorporation of sound in uh, the, the thinking through of people and the thinking through of the role that music plays in our identities and in our understandings of who we are. Um, and so uh, that was present. There were references to um, perfumes, you know, the red of your grandmother's perfume. So I, I realized that I was, as I was watching your presentation, I was also uh, sort of tuning in through multiple senses, and I very much appreciated that. Um, I, yeah, and I don't know, um, you know, I, I was struck too by this very interesting. Um, Di dialogue you were having between uh, the kind of theorizing of border life and the in-between um, of like Gloria Anzaldúa and, um, and then also uh, the critical writing that allows us to better understand how kind of col colonial discourses have shaped um, cultural institutions and um, our understandings of of you know taboos and color relationships, et cetera, with with David um, uh, Bachelor's work, so that was a very interesting. Um, you know, I'm sure you've read a million things, but the fact that you chose those two to put next to each other, I thought resonated really uh, beautifully. Um, I guess one of the things that I also began to uh, think about as I listened to you were how how. Each of the uh, figures that you were making, um, the fact that you kind of had to move into the digital, perhaps, or that you were focusing on the digital, I think opens up a lot of new possibilities. And so, as I was looking at the at the hyper vibrancy of those colors, um, and the way in which you can begin to really play with the figuration in in and patterning in new ways, I couldn't help but see these characters as um, not only characters in your life, but potentially the beginnings of characters that they could in evolve into that would be perhaps even more fictional. And so the play between truth and biography and the potential for welcoming a kind of poetic fiction, it, it seems like something that could be really uh, rife. And um, when I first glanced at your um, work, I was thinking a lot about the, the writing of Carmen uh, Maria Marchado, um, Her Body and Other Parties. I don't know if you know this book, but I was thinking about the ways in which a lot of um, Latinx writers are also uh, sort of um, starting from biography, but then expanding out from it and using the people in their lives, but allowing that to be the beginning point of, of uh, greater imaginings. So I think that there's a, a way in which you, you are also sitting on the verge of possibly um, animating these figures in ways that go beyond the, the homage and the tribute that you so beautifully um, sort of outlined for us. And of course, the tufting ultimately, and the translation back to textiles also allows you to play even more with, um, uh, you know, not only uh, the sort of um, 
representations of the people as you've known them, but also what you can, you know, what what they might what they might bear as the, another kind of generation of thinking. Um, so I I couldn't help but think about the work of Saya Wolfek, who is a very interesting artist who who does a lot of these kinds of things where she starts with something real but then takes it pushes it and pushes it and pushes it into another kind of realm. So those are all of the uh, the things that I was thinking about. But I um, I want to turn it over so you have another set of. Uh, ideas, but I, I just you really got me thinking about a lot of things and I, I very much enjoyed um, seeing your work. Yeah, I great, great presentation, Shanti. And I, I definitely agree with um, a lot of what Lydia was saying. It's such a, um, what a beautiful like, oh, homage. It was really, really striking. Um, and not not just because uh, the colors that you picked um, just just work together so, so well. Um, just on a, a purely like technical level, the, the colors you picked. And even though I know they had, um, you know, all that meaning and to have uh, you take us through the narrative of how you like not thinking of colors through the names, you know, we come to know them in English, uh, but through, through a narrative, um, such a great, such a great like, yeah, lens uh, to work through. And I also thought that practice, again, to kind of Lydia's point of language and, and, and slippage, um, was just so so interesting um, to think through. Well, a color doesn't, we see it. Um, and as Lydia was saying, there's kind of like a, is it synesthesia? When you can hear it, you can smell it. Um, and so because all of these different senses are, are informing your, your color choices, which also just work on, you know, a, a, a technical level to bring us that, those scents and to bring us that, the narratives of, of those people and their longer histories of, you know, like a, a, a triumph over uh, colonialism or a, as um, I think Allison also said in the chat, uh, di divestment from whiteness, you know, they're, they're really declarative and they're like um, arriving. Um, so I think just on that purely technical level, but then to bring in the narrative of um, a color isn't just what we, you know, name it. It's not green, it has all these different um, associations with it. So yeah, that was really, really, um, really great work. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about um, actually was um, when, where did you source those family photos from? Um, and I also remember you kind of talking, you said collaboration a couple of times. So I wanted to know a little bit more about like your collaboration with your, with your family and how, how you're framing like, yeah, that collaboration. Yeah. Well, I think I came at such a like later part, like there was obviously so much before me, but like, as I said, like there's this huge age gap between like my sister. And so like all of sort of those like histories always come up in like current conversations that I'm a part of that I don't necessarily have like too much context into. And so I think that's like where the storytelling part comes in. It's because they're like the stories that they're telling me. Um, as well as like photographs. Um, I don't have any of them with me. It's all my mom and my sister. So like, I cannot tell you the amount of like messages and pictures and just like, I mean, they did as much of the light work as I did. And without those pictures simply, I don't know if it would be here. Um, so yeah, and just those conversations, the stories as well as just like literally sending pictures. Yeah, okay. That's really, yeah, that's really great to know. Um, that it is that collaboration because also as you know the collaboration is in the work and like you said it's in it's in the leg work um but you're also putting them together as this homage or um it seems to me like uh in one part it's like um a, a thanks like you know for 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 building you and the the conditions which allow like you to be strong and and to make this work um but i also see it as kind of um uh, a gift of, of liberation um, in some ways. There's an artist, uh, she, she's only like 30. She just graduated from her MFA at UC Berkeley. Um, and she started this religion, her name's Hisu Kwan and she started this like feminist religion, but where she thinks about her ancestors as she puts them in spaces where they aren't uh, to liberate them. And, you know, they didn't have to live under patriarchy the way that um, they did and just kind of, that that space of like imagining otherwise um 
And so I, your works are not like, um, you know, they don't look the same at all, but I think there's uh, something about that kind of, you know, matriline and also um, radical imagination coming, coming through in your work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it is that radical imagination. I love that you brought that term in, um, uh, Catherine, because it, it is that, that ability to um, kind of think beyond what the scripts have been that is so key. And so you've be already begun to do that. And I, I just wanted to ask one other question, Shanti, it's, is that, you know, I, was there anything in the working with the digital and the, and the kind of uh, being limited perhaps because of this condition that we find ourselves in that revealed something that surprised you or that um, opened up a new horizon for you? I would say I didn't really feel limited because mm -hmm. every detail of like, I think like my mom's collage, like her sleeves are made of like ocean waves that I've like, like I just find so much enjoyment and like possibility in like taking a picture and making it into a different shape. Um, but I have worked digitally and then transferred into textiles and it, it's completely different because I, obviously the process. Um, what I think I have discovered is I don't necessarily have to stick to sort of like one tool per se. So like in the tufting, that will be like one aspect of it, but I also want to like do some painting and then maybe do like some small like detail embroidery. So I think it's really helped me kind of not limit myself in the physical process to sort of just one way of making. Yeah, and also the tufting allows, I mean, suddenly you start to think about like, what does it mean to suddenly get 3D, you know? And, and how can it, rather than it just being a flat kind of remove, you know, heightened surface, like how could the textures actually become a player in these characters, right? Like if you're thinking about animating the possibilities um, and also like, you know, where do they move just to the edge of grotesque, you know, because there's also something very interesting about those kinds of um, uh, possibilities for creating affect in the viewer. So uh, I think that it's great that you play with the multiple um, kinds of forms and, and media. I'm going to have to cut in here. <clears throat> Thank you. Those were that was a beautiful presentation and incredible comments to hear in response to you, Shanti. So thank you both. We have next Megan. <clears throat> Hello. So Megan, can you pause for one second? Yeah. Um, respondents, were you able to hear the, the, the alarm that I set? No? Okay. I, I will have to cut in around 10 minutes then. So forgive me in advance. <laughs> okay. All right, Megan, okay. please. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great. <clears throat> uh, hi, I'm Megan Livy. I'm an individualized major with an emphasis on photography and graphic design. This is my senior thesis titled Tame the Gaze. Men act and women appear. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. This determines not only most relations between men and women, but also the relation of women to themselves. The surveyor of women and herself is male, the surveyed female. Thus, she turns herself into an object of vision, a sight, by John Berger in Ways of Seeing. When I take out my camera, I can see people's thought process as they begin to perform for the perceived audience. In this project, I analyze the impact of the male gaze on female identified people and the feeling of expanding in the corner of the male gaze. When I am behind the camera, I use my female gaze as well as the male gaze of the camera. During this shoot, I felt the tense atmosphere of the male gaze entering the scene and a quote by John Berger came to mind. Men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. As a photographer, I am constantly observing. 
I was being observed in these photographs as well as observing. I understood the model camera relationship in a way that I couldn't when, when behind the camera. Feeling the male gaze in this face forced me to pause. I've always named my cameras Edward and I've never thought twice about assigning a gender to my camera. Is the male gaze internalized within me? Does the camera have an inherently male gaze? Tim Walker is an influence of mine because of his use of distorted proportions, lighting, set design, and costume design. I also admire his high clarity and high contrast editing styles, styles that I use in my own work. This piece is titled Wonderful Things, and it was photographed by Tim Walker in 2018. In this piece, I really admire the distortion. Uh, I love how you can't see the model's feet in this, <laughs> even though they're there. Uh, the colors and the contrast, just really everything about it uh, is just amazing. Annie Leibovitz is another influence of mine. Her use of styling portraits, expressive facial expressions, and models taking up space, specifically in Alice in Wonderland, have inspired my work over the years. I had the opportunity to meet her uh, last year and it was really amazing to meet one of my idols and hear her talk about her own work. Uh, and it was just an honor to be in her presence. So this piece is titled Alice in Wonderland and it was photographed by Annie Leibovitz in 2003. I really admire the way that the model is taking up this space uh, as Alice in Wonderland does and just the distortion and again, high contrast and um, the unique set design. This is some of my past work and it's titled Cornered. It's from 2020 and it's a 13 by 19 digital portrait. Uh, and this shoot made me realize that I love shooting at extreme angles and corners, and I love black and white. <laughs> I began by shooting in the middle of a cyclorama wall, but I slowly made my way over to the corner with the model. Using the corner allowed us to get more dramatic angles through posing. The distortion and high contrast editing greatly influenced my senior project. The United States has an office called the Office on Violence Against Women, as opposed to the Office of Violence by Men. Warnings are ingrained in us at a young age. Don't go anywhere alone at night. Carry pepper spray. Allow friends to follow your location and follow theirs. Take well-lit routes if you are walking alone at night. Hold your keys in between your fingers while walking to your car. Car services are safer than public transportation until they're not. This series titled Tame the Gaze depicts the feeling of being cornered by the presence of the male gaze and the empowerment of physically and mentally pushing against that gaze. My body is distorted through the use of a wide angle lens as well as positioning the camera on the ground about six inches away from my body at a 45 degree upwards angle. To get into these positions, I had to physically stretch and distort my body in order to fill the space and push against the corner. I chose to wear solid colors and to edit these photographs in high contrast black and white. These stylistic choices keep the focus on my body expanding in the volumetric space, as well as forcing my body in the corner to remain separate. My body fills the corner in these images when my arms and legs stretch out of the frame and follow the guiding lines of the corner. While photographing myself, the goal was to be as expansive as possible.
There came a point when I wasn't even aware of the fact that I was being photographed. I was just focusing on the physical exertion of bending and enlarging my figure to be as spacious as possible. I chose to shoot these indoors in my room because that is a space that I have to work with. Before COVID, I really enjoyed shooting in the studio. So this project has forced me to practice my skills using the materials and locations that I have at the time. While I was filling the frame, I felt strong and unapologetically visible. Being in the physical and metaphorical corner of the male gaze while pushing against it at the same time has forced my relationship with photography to evolve. This shoot left me with a question of, how can I create a space for others to feel unapologetically visible and expansive while I'm photographing them? And I wanted to thank many people who have helped me along this journey. Uh, my mom and my dad, Nathan, Julia, Amanda, June, Rachel, Chris, Jason, Ellen, Anna, Madison, Cameron, Alexa, Alex, Louise, Joseph, Dion, Kelly, Kyle, Emily, Mira, Deborah, Adam, and Josh. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Thank you. That was beautiful. So we'll start comments from Catherine. Yeah, great. Thank you, Megan, um, again, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I guess I'll start a little bit with, um, I really appreciated um, in this presentation, you giving us um, the process of like how you created these photos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, especially like, as for me, I personally as a curator don't have a making practice. And so mm -hmm. with, you know, photographers and printmakers, I'm always wondering like, you know, just tell me technically how you did that. So I, yeah. I do really appreciate that, you know, that you shared that with all of us. So, so thank, thank you. you. Um, and yeah, just from um, a formal perspective, I thought they were really, really interesting. I definitely think, um, you know, taking up uh, the space in, in the distorted way was really uh, I wanted to, 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 I wish the photos had been on, on the screen longer to really think mm. about like, oh, like how the angles were all, all working together. Um, yeah. So from a formal perspective, it's, I think it's, it's really, really working. Um, Thank you. I have a, a question. Were these on, on a self timer? Yeah. So I had, I actually got a remote for these. So I, I would use the remote and then I would throw it out of the frame just in time. <laughs> So there's some really funny ones of me like, no, and the remote's just still in the frame. So, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's really funny. Um, Cause it brings that kind of sense of like, um, ur ur a sense of like urgency in some ways, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which I definitely felt uh, was, was in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was interesting to see as well, like, um, you know, one of the things I, I also was hoping you could speak a little bit about on is, you know, you're thinking about um, the gaze through through the camera itself and something mm -hmm. that I've, uh, you know, has like haunted me since I learned about it was the Countess of Castiglione self-portraits. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but she like mm -hmm. near the, like the birth of photography, like in the 1800s. Um, she started just taking these self these self portraits, and typically mm -hmm. you needed somebody else to take the picture, right? It's yeah. um, it's usually a um, you know, in some ways a, a collaborative thing. But like you said, there's always someone's gaze on you, yeah, um, exactly. and then independently, um, you know, as you know, we've seen the the camera, uh, you know, we shoot photography. It's mm -hmm. it has these like masculine qualities um, um, to it. Um, but yeah, and so she would take these pictures um, and, you know, send them to, to lovers um, and whatnot. But it really was this time of like um, a woman taking pictures of herself and feeling powerful. Um, yeah. 
So uh, even though, you know, she, she was, didn't think of herself as an artist, but um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think in retrospect, she, she really was. Um, and so one of the things I was hoping you could speak just a little bit about was um, yeah. the, the relationship between the viewer and, and the gauges, like, you know, that we bring um, mm-hmm. inherently. And are you seeing, when you're saying uh, put, you know, you're literally pushing against, against the frame of, yeah. <laughs> you know, the gaze, gaze of, of the camera. Um, but I'm wondering if you uh, see yourself as also pushing against the gaze of, of the viewer who is approaching mm-hmm. these photographs. Yeah, I definitely do. And um, one thing, when, when I said that I felt the male gaze entering the room, that was in my own thoughts, basically. And it was like, who's going to see these photographs? Mm. What are they going to think about these? Are they going to sexualize me when they see Mm -hmm. these or are they going to see my intentions with these um and i think i don't think that social media has helped with that (laughs) because personally for photography i started out on instagram and that Mm. kind of is what what launched me into photography um so i'm always thinking about the viewer because especially if i'm proud of a piece i want to share it with others but then I'm thinking about that as I'm creating it. Mm-hmm. So I think um, one benefit of this shoot, as I mentioned at one point, was um, because I was having to bend myself in all these weird positions and stuff, I was more focused on just expanding. And I really mm-hmm. wasn't aware for part of the time that I was taking my picture. It was kind of like, not an annoyance necessarily, but it was like something else that was going on was me Um, releasing the shutter and throwing the remote out of the frame because I was just trying to fill the space as much as possible so I think the viewer the viewer's gaze is definitely always in my mind but Mm -hmm. for a brief period there it wasn't and I think Mm. that that felt really nice (laughs) yeah 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 and I think those distortions of the body too they kind of have this like duality where like like you said are are people going to sexualize it and Mm -hmm. there can be um you know, that aspect of, of like bodily distortion, but I also think it's this other, like, it's very much, um, I don't know, like an othering, like in some ways, not only trying to get out of the frame, but get out of the, the form of, of the body or like what we expect in the form of the body. Um, so um, that's what I, uh, that's like the kind of the goal of the distortion is to distort in ways that just aren't, anatomically possible like mm. really short torso super long legs and then the opposite and like just yeah just kind of seeing in what ways I can distort my body to just not look like a body anymore almost mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. and just see how far I can push that boundary <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to mm. Lydia oh, well I mean I a lot of what you're talking about are, are a lot of the things that I was um definitely responding to and uh, you know the the desire to move past the limits of your own body or to test the limits of your own body to understand um, what where those limits are and where you might push them differently the next time. I mean, I, I really felt like, you know, that kind of um, Gumby bo- uh, doll, right? Like there was a yeah. whole <laughs> way in which uh, this for me, um, and you t- in, the, in listening to the way you were talking about it, also, it's a very interesting kind of point where on the one hand, you're conscious of yourself making images mm-hmm. for the camera. On the other hand, increasingly, as I heard you talk, it really became about a performative act. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that, and that really, you know, there's a whole kind of way in which if you think of it rather than image making, but as performance and thinking Mm -hmm. about like what would it mean to sort of just shift the framework slightly what would you produce if you imagined it more as a um you know a a 4d uh moment and i think there's a real uh possibility there to explore that further i also along with the kind of desire to break the limits of one's body or what you're told are the limits of your body which i think are also part of your political under Mm -hmm. Uh, pinning is also it felt very much like uh, the about um, testing and uh, expanding the limits of the architecture and the space mm-hmm. you know yeah. so <laughs> that if something is cage like or tiny or producing a claustrophobia like how do you how do you manipulate within it in order to redefine it as something that doesn't stop you but actually enables you like I'm thinking about like parkour 
for example. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and that, that way of like, if you, you know, if you come from, uh, uh, you know, the, the ghettos of Paris and you find yourself constantly sort of up against uh, metaphorical, uh, you know, kind of obstructions and mm -hmm. boundaries. How do you turn those into the opportunities to um, play, to, yeah. kind of, you know, and also to um, just refuse? So I thought a lot about that, how your work on the one hand it was, it was moving the way you were talking about the, the uh, danger um, as a woman moving in public spaces mm -hmm. and the kind of grief that we feel when we realize uh, sort of how um, society has uh, structured our, our possibilities in open space. And on the other hand, I, I think about that and I'm being influenced right now by a show that's uh, just opened in New York by Okwi Enwazar about grief and grievance. You mm -hmm. know, like how do you move from that space of the sadness or the limitation or the mourning yeah. over a condition to one where you act at it as a, a grievance and, mm -hmm. and that you transform it. And like, we sometimes think those words are the same, but they're not. Yeah. <laughs> the other one is really about like taking action against something. Yeah. So I, I appreciated that, um, that there were all of these little nuggets that I think you could really break open and explore mm -hmm. even more uh, yeah. as you develop the work. So thank you for thank that. You. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really liked what you said about uh, photography as a performance, because um, I, like I said, outside of COVID, I like shooting in a studio and usually I'll have a makeup artist, an assistant, a few models, and we just really have like a really fun time and just kind of moving around in the space and like trying out different angles and all these things. So it's really like, even though we are shooting, it's more like it's more like play in a way, and then more like a performance um, mm -hmm. as well. So, so that I'll definitely think more about that because that was that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Have you ever uh, just curious? Have you ever um, considered or or uh, experimented with a more than one figure? I mean, yourself in relation. Yeah, um, I have in the past, just when doing family portraits, things like that. But um, yeah, I think if I were to, I would need three people total, just uh, for the balance of it. But um, one thing I, I've been thinking throughout this was actually to, to make the space around me smaller. So because the corner, it's, I can't actually fill the whole corner because of it, it's tall, because of how high the ceiling is, but if I uh, find a way to like find smaller spaces and smaller corners and, or like a box or things like that, then I could, I could enclose the space around me more and kind of show that um, contrast more and show myself breaking out of that or pushing against that more if I'm closer to it. So uh, that's something that I would like to do in the future. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. That was really, really beautiful. I love your photos and you really stretched into it this semester. Literally and figuratively. Thank you. And <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, next we have Sarah Jane. Hi. Okay, let's share my screen. Can you see my screen and not my notes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Hello, thank you for being here today. I'm Sarah Jane Walcott. I'm a part of the textile community at CCA. Today, I'm presenting my thesis work entitled Four by Five Color Project. Over the last year and a half, the arcing intention of this project is grounded in art therapy at the intersection of language and color in the year 2020. I'm currently an applicant for art therapy programs. Due to this, using therapeutic practices is at the centerfold of this body of work. Artist statement, to color year in review, to color her sickness, to color her with wealth, to color her with color, to color her temperature, to color her beyond the binary, to color her possible. This project asks the community to fall into color, to capture a fleeting emotion in time, to look beyond the lure of the line, to transfer what we leave unsaid, to render language inside out, to be veiled in a technicolor glow. Color holds more truths than language can hide. I'm a consumer of words. With this being said, I fundamentally believe that thought is art. 
Reading is an essential foundation of my art practice. It assists in how I process and identify in the world. London-based artist, theorist, and writer David Batchelor emphasized in his book, The Luminous and the Gray, language and diagrams enable us to navigate the extraordinary complex terrain of color and to communicate with one another about color. And without them, we would easily get lost. But at the same time, there's value in getting lost and becoming immersed in the endless proliferations of actual blues or greens or yellows or grays that are always around us and always merging into one another, but which often go unnoticed. This idea embodies my work. Without these readings, such as David Batchelor's chromophobia, a fear of corruption or contamination through color, has lurked within Western culture since antiquity. Or Elsa Renee's cloth that does not die, die dives into the indigenous thinking and theories who probe the social and political significance of cloth, and cloth dyeing specifically indigo in the body. Or specific color biographies, such as the story of Coach Chenille and Amy Butler Greenfield's A Perfect Red. Without these theories, without these histories, there would be no theoretical scaffolding for speaking about color, dissecting color, and navigating the complex terrain of color. After reading all these books and many more, it is with this understanding I would like to take a pause and acknowledge the westernized discourse of color is bound up in the primitive feminine cosmetic, queer, vulgar, pathological, supplementary, and psychedelic, but most importantly, the colonization of colored bodies. And when we speak about color, we are speaking in terms that are married to the ideals of Western thinking. With all this swirling in my mind, earlier last year, I began, began a community-based art practice, which I dubbed Paint and Sip. Founded in this idea of what is the intersection of language and color, the acknowledgement that language fails us, can chroma be used as a universal lexicon and more importantly, an inclusive emotional language? Because when we speak of color, we are not speaking about color, we are speaking about the ambiguity of color. I created a participation outline. Participants were presented with four by five white cards, a series of six words, paint one word for each card, analog mixing of color using gouache, mark making is up to the participant, one color per card is encouraged. Last spring at the height of the pandemic, I made the decision that I safely hold, only had access to my community. This body of work represents one specific discourse community, mine. In retrospect, this body of work is also about our intimate communal relationships and dynamics over the last year. I presented participants with a series of six words, pandemic, economy, protest, ecological disasters, political elections, and future under the specific context of the year 2020. Here's a series of photos from the paint and sip event. My hope was to choose words ambiguous enough so that each participants would be able to reflect then transfer their experiences in color. Enough space to honor our individual experiences of the last year in a communal environment. There is an element of play at each event. I encourage everyone to be tactile, a little messy, find their inner child and liquid encouragement if needed. As gestures and colors began to appear, I noticed that what we choose to keep internally private and possibly unbeknownst to us is accidentally made public. Participants are expressing colors intimately. In most cases, participants introspectives happen days or weeks later and would reach out to me to discuss their color experiences. My intention is that one gesture, one color could be a starting point for someone else's reframing of their relationship to color, whether that be internally, socially, politically, or culturally, and that they are brave enough to challenge and stand up for color and those of color. If only we could all be so brave to share our colors out loud. In six months, three states with 50 participants resulting in 300 color cards. This is a snapshot example of Mark making a color in each category made by participants. I did not anticipate symbolism, but of course it alludes to line and therefore language and how intertwined color is to gesture. With 300 sample, car sample cards, a small archive was beginning to emerge. As I was no longer just the facilitator of the paint and sip events of navigating the role of performer and observer of the complex terrain of collective color, I was now able to engage with color, language, and gesture individually. I decided to create a series of six artist books, one for each word. An archive is being created. Within that archive, there are 50 colors cards for each word. I created a system of curation through statistics that I felt was the best overall representation for each category. Looking for the mathematical mean for each category that 
encompass diversity in the spectrum of color, compressing 50 cards to eight. This representation is still rooted in my subconscious bias because color is color and it is not unbiased. From there, I created a digital prototype of the accordion artist books I would create. In homage to the name of the project, the scale of each book is four by five inches when expanded 50 inches in length. Using white paper was intentional throughout this project. The cutouts in each panel is a reference to the westernized curatorial process and its attempts to contain color and render it colorless. The gesture on the left was made by a paint and sip participant. Using gesso transfer method with papers, the image on the right is the transfer. I decided to honor the gesture and color created by the participant in the transfer process, instead of only abstracting the color to create a uniform color transfer. Each transfer from the analog to the digital is an abstraction from the original color and gesture, resulting in color shifts. In my artist book, I use the verb of transfer to convey my means of transfer paper. Yet transfer as a noun is essential to the essence of color's identity, to the psychological and physical transfer of identity, the conveyance of color. The process of transfers became a tangible color theory. Every reading of color clicked into place. I felt the violence, the unveiling, the physicality and the hope of color. Each transfer was created in silence and in meditation. They demand a silence and gratitude to honor the participants and their experiences of the last year and their color stories. Beginning in chronological series of events in 2020, this is how my community colored pandemic. How they colored economy. How they colored protests. How they colored ecological disasters. How they colored political elections. And most importantly, how they colored the future. I'm currently in the next phase of this project, investigating color patterns for each category in the social, political, and cultural underlying reasons as to why, with the intention that the project grows and evolves. This is the first iteration of many. I ask you now what I asked each paint and sit participant. In one word, what is the language of color? This body of work would not be possible without California College of the Arts professors Deborah Valoma and Angela Hennessy's Chromophilia Seminar. I express gratitude for sharing their stories about color and to those that participate in the Paint and Sip Community Project. Thank you for expressing yourself in color and to my beloved friend Shanti, to whom is color herself. And I leave you with one last remark that is very near and dear to my heart. Yoko Ono, who stated, if people want to make war, they should make a color war and paint each other's cities up in the nights and pinks and greens. Thank you. Wonderful, Shanti. Uh, I'm sorry, Sarah Jane. That was really, really, really. And you got it all in in less than 10 minutes. 50 slides. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Excellent. So, Lydia. Yeah. Where do I begin, Sarah Jane? You have so many. Um, so many layers to unpack in this work, you know? Um, and it's interesting because when I got the preview, I, I just kind of got the final archival images of the accordion books. And I had really no idea that um, the process was so complex in the sense of how you arrived at those, uh, you know, transferred images. So, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of how to really, uh, you know, where to begin with this. Um, I, I guess I want, I just want to have one more point of clarity because since I didn't see it coming, the, uh, the uh, kind of social engagement piece of this whole thing. Uh, and that I, you know, that, that idea that so much of the work was also in the interactions that were the ephemeral exchanges that you had during these 
uh, events. And you had the events themselves. And then you also had these moments. I was struck by the photograph of, of the uh, images on the ground and then people looking over them and potentially sharing stories. So I'm, I'm wondering, it just as a challenge, you know, in the sense of the, uh, this, this is the challenge of, of doing socially engaged practice is um, you've transferred and translated these experiences very specifically, but are there also ways in which you're, you are interested in capturing uh, the words? I mean, I know you're working against the words through the color, but I'm wondering about those stories more and how, how, do, you archive, how do you archive more of the action and the, the dialogic exchange that went on? Or is that important to you? I feel that it is important to me because I made the decision in the beginning of this project to focus more on the communal aspects, knowing it would be an archive. I knew an archive would happen naturally. Mm -hmm. And so during these events, afterwards, I would do a series of interviews with some of the people that would participate. I would work, some of these um, events were also recorded. And so with audio and so when you go back and listen there's like these snapshot moments of what you're picking up people discussing but I think for right now it's just like you have to kind of sit within the experiences of other people and maybe some of those experiences shouldn't be shared like they should just be between me and the participant and so I'm still trying to figure out the balance of like what they would feel comfortable being revealed and what I feel is comfortable being revealed. Yeah. But I really think those communal events are at the heart of this, are at the heart of this conversation. Yeah. Well, I just, I'm struck by the messiness of those on the one hand, you know, and then the ways in which your transfer, uh, you know, it, it, it there's a very beautiful aesthetic move you make through the transfer, uh, but then it's also very um, contained, right? And it, it becomes uh, very much, as you said, in the kind of gridded nature of, uh, uh, of a particular kind of modernist treatment of, of structure. Um, and so I, I'm also struck by your very, the logical, um, uh, kinds of processes that you engage in the transfer and the translation that tr also brings up a lot of this ideas around data visualization, right? And so I'm wondering about that because on the one hand, you know, there is a kind of uh, graph-like um, treatment and also you're working against that. I mean, there's something much more texturally rich in the squares themselves, mm -hmm. um, but then you're also, uh, you know, you you were using a kind of mathematical logic almost, or a, a very kind of clear conceptual logic of how these things are are numer uh, numbered and um, structured and all that. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about those those kinds of seeming binaries and how you play with those. I come from a I come from a background in biochemistry and in architecture, so it's like ingrained within my my thought. And so, I think there was something for me that was just like I need to create a set of rules and principles that I stand by throughout this entire project, or I myself would become lost within the color and within and just sort of like within the discussion. And so, I think the gridding and the process of creating these artist books for me really became unpacking all the reading around westernized discourse of color. And within that gridding system, I'm accepting that that is, that is the result, but how do I challenge against that as well? So there is this idea of like ambiguity, but there is this idea of like juxtaposition of who I am versus what society tells me color should be. And like, how do I break that? But how do I also know that it's contained? And I think, that's why using white paper was so essential for me throughout this project. And also using a grid system was very important for me as yeah. well. Yeah, and, and hearing you talk about these as a kind of set of artistic protocols that you're, mm -hmm. you're setting up for yourself um, to you know, sort of manage the complexity is also very interesting um, be, you know, in, in relation to all of that. Catherine, I, I wanna make sure I'm leaving room for you because I'm sure you have much to bring to the table. 
Yeah. Yeah. So like Lydia said, like super, super rich work, um, for the sake of time, um, there are two things that I wanted to, to talk about. And yeah, so similarly to Lydia, um, in the images that, you know, we got that are just that, just the archive, um, I was thinking about that chronology of color that you, you have in, um, and at first I was thinking like, you know, color as you're thinking about like challenging, um, challenging language and, and English, our sentences are chronologic, right? They have a, a left and a right um, ending and beginning. Um, but then when I started to see the, the archive, to me, they read in some ways as like film, which is again, that kind of process of, of chronology of, of, of beginning and end. Um, so I think those had, I don't know if that was intentional, but that if it was amazing and if it wasn't, there's a really interesting kind of, um, poetics between that. So yeah, the, the, I think holding both tension and similarities, uh, between chronology and, uh, chromatics in, in New York, um, was really interesting. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about, um, in your work, and, and Lydia was talking a bit about, you know, translation and, and transfer and how, you know, in, you know, pushing against language and language is uh, in many ways, like an authority on what, what color is and what color should be. Um, and so when, often when there are, are, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of something, people will describe it as encyclopedic to mean it is authoritative. But I found in this work, because there's so much multiplicity within, within color and, and how it is, it slips from or authoritative back into um, a kind of like um, nebulous space where it, it is embedded again, you know, it is again separated from language. And um, again, I think it's a site of tension, which is really, really interesting to, to hold for, for the viewer and also um, for you of an artist of this constant slippage between, you know, the work being authoritative uh, and then slipping back into uh, one of, of, of multiplicity. Um, so, yeah, and, and also just your presentation, you put in so much information, it was so easy to follow and that's really difficult to do. So I just wanted to congratulate you on that as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you very much. That was really amazing. And thank you for the comments. Um, we will move on and we're right on schedule. So thanks to everybody for holding to the times. So Lulu. Hi. Feel free to share your screen. Can you guys see it? Yes. Awesome. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming and listening. I'm Luella Evans. I'm graduating this year with an individualized major, and today I'll be presenting my thesis work titled Tinderbox. The boundaries between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. I love this quote because some days, most days, I feel like I'm living in a Mad Max movie. And I really enjoy Haraway's feminist approach to science fiction and inserting a woman's voice into a realm typically dominated by men. I'm standing in front of my car, door open, books in hand. I watch as the flaky gray ash flutters over my head onto the seat. The sky is orange, so orange, it looks like it is 5 p.m. instead of 9 a.m. It is already 70 degrees and the wind is howling through the trees. I turn to look at my reflection in the car window. Standing there is a girl wearing a pink sundress, combat boots, and a hot pink gas mask. I crawl into the car with all my supplies for school. The sun is a red fireball in the sky. The air smells of campfire soap sheets. I truly admire the installation artist Cornelia Parker. Her installations make deconstruction and chaos look ephemeral. She usually pulls her material from wreckage, piecing rich history and taking pieces with rips, history, and stories, reassembling them into gallery spaces. <clears throat> Another influence of mine is John Aconca. He is um, a filmmaker and installation artist. 
His work explores themes of climate change, post-colonialism, temporality, and memory. I'm always entranced by the way he layers narratives and combines archival footage with original footage. My first piece, It's Time to Go, was created in response to the massive fires in 2018 in Santa Rosa, California that destroyed thousands of homes and killed several people. I decided then to have multiple conversations with people who I knew that had lost their homes. I used photographs, film, and a collection of audio to make a soundscape of fire. Through the use of archival material and original footage, I've woven a narrative that presents the reality of an environment in, in community in crisis. Proceed with Caution is a face covering screen printed with a motif of cupids holding machine guns, barbed wire, and skulls. In the center is text saying proceed with caution, or else I should add, a threat but also a warning to viewers who walk by. This piece has been worn to many protests demanding gun control, climate justice, and human rights. Quarantina is a self-portrait. I took this during the first shelter in place when the wildfires turned the sky gray orange for weeks. This figure concealed in a gas mask and cloaked in gauzy fabric has become a reoccurring character in my work. She is me, but she is also a reminder of the harsh reality of the slowly unlivable conditions we face. This series that I started in 2019, um, I consider this a project that will never be finished as long as I stay in Northern California. My hometown is altered by the effects of climate change every October. This work is photographed from my own experiences with the fires and the traumatic stories I've collected within my community. Through this series, I investigate what we lost in the fires. Through memory, I investigate what we can revive from what was destroyed. I'm continually thinking about concepts of deconstruction, rebuilding, and working against time. What can be preserved in the rubble? As the fires continue every year, I'm able to identify the years I took photo the photographs based on the wreckage on the ground. Since the pandemic, the ash and charred wood is littered with single-use masks. In these next two photos, my character reappears. She is exploring the land. She stands in the distance while death surrounds her. Because of human development and how unnaturally hot the fires burned, it is a lot harder for these areas to regrow so the land has become almost a permanent grave site for these trees. These are pieces I found over many different areas around Sonoma County and I've arranged them by where I found them and whose property I found them. I plan to continue this collection and explore further into these precious objects. 
I'm excited to take the research and materials gathered to expand and hopefully share within my community when it is safe to do so. One of the treasures I was able to retrieve from the fires were these short films of my family and neighbors. Most of it was too damaged to keep, but I got some pieces that are visible. Recovered family gatherings is fawning over family stories, forever scarred, marking a point in time that day, that particular fire. I want to end with a poem written in collaboration with Karina Espudo titled Apocalyptic. Inhabitants of the fourth ring wait for heavy stones to be laid on greedy chests. Wrap us up in bubble wrap, fishbowl vision. Block out the full grown sun. The tricks aren't penniless anymore. You walk on all fours in the shadowed corners, add inches to the soles of our boots. So we tread lightly through the green sludge and glass. Take notes from the crows, shape our face in their likeness cover us in your rubber plague masks. Tell us it looks good, looks right to protect all flesh. Take our dimes, checks, laundry quarters, turn it, magician, into fancy branded armor. Tell us the age of fire doesn't scare you. The tricks aren't penniless anymore. Thank you all so much. Thank you for my friends and family and professors for all your support. I truly, truly appreciate you guys. Thank you, Lulu. That was beautiful. Thank you. We'll start with uh, Catherine now. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Lulu, for that presentation. Um, really poignant, um, really poignant work. Um, I at first I just had a, a quick question about your first video was the soundscape um, also found sounds like the found footage or was that a soundscape that you had created in, in the studio. It was a mixture of both, mm -hmm. some of it was like the wind was taken just through my phone and like collecting sounds, but some of it also I just had to look up through like archives and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So something that um, really uh, came came out to the forefront for me in your work is this kind of role between, um, you know, in some ways, uh, a little bit of like speculative fiction. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's reality. So it's in some ways, to me, it, it was this really interesting, like, um, dualism where, you know, your your framing of um, in your photographs of the, um, and in some ways it's like an archive of destruction, an archive of debris. Um, and so there's always your own, your own framing in it, uh, that human intervention, which I think uh, speaks to the, the larger human, the human intervention that happens in, um, that you're documenting. Um, so I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I was also thinking about um, that the the objects um, from uh, the the found objects from Sonoma County. Um, they reminded me of an artist I'm working with right now. Her name is Jenny Kendler, and she actually uh, biochars uh, books on climate change um, that were in like discarded bins. Um, and so the objects that you get are these like completely burned books, and then you eventually. Um, you put them into the ground and they are carbon, carbon negative. Um, so I was wondering uh, for that piece specifically with the, with the, the charred. Um, so in, in installation, the, the rearrangements of, of how they are in, in the space is really important. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to learn a little bit more about, um, you know, how you're thinking about arranging, arranging those objects. Um, and I know you said when it's safe to, to share them, um, but yeah, just thinking about again that like marking that marking of of debris as also a passage of time as uh, you know climate crisis gets gets worse and worse. Um, but yeah, could you talk a little bit about how you'd like like to um, start start arranging them and the kinds of frames that you um, are thinking thinking through those objects? Yeah, um, 
I originally just started off with kind of this documentation style where I was collecting them and putting them in groups of like where I found it, where mm-hmm. on almost like a map I found them. And just so like I didn't like completely lose track of everything. Mm-hmm. And I had so many conversations with different people. I wanted to make sure that they were in their right place. And I didn't like get things confused. But um, kind of as I continue this process, I've been translating them into a more, I would say like poetic and emotional kind mm-hmm. of um, expression where I've been like using Ciano type process to take imagery of like the lace, uh, uh, what is it, bookmark and the Fahrenheit sticker and all those things. Mm. And I'm just kind of translating them uh, into fabric and then through that maybe a more uh, expressive piece that can work with memory and loss Mm. and, but still using that documentation and all that kind of collection that I've done. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the the film work too. I just found um especially the films that you said uh you know the the portions that survived a fire again. I just thought it was so um in some way like really subtly poignant but then, you know, uh of, of course it's about um like you said again these like markings and like the personal loss and memory that is happening um because of these like human interventions. Um so yeah, um, I think for the sake of time, I'll turn it over to Lydia, but uh, it, I'm definitely like feeling it like right here. <laughs> um, so I'll, yeah, really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a very visceral, um, uh, you know, combination of, of ways in which you are trying to get at a community in crisis and, and represent a, an experience that, is a, an incredibly deep trauma um, that you know is on the one hand this very intimate experience you've had of the people that you know but of course is writ large right now across the planet because of the conditions that we find ourselves in you know this moment of um, the Anthropocene and beyond um, so I, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting about this as a, as a kind of artistic project is that in the in the face of something so immediate and so intense, you know, sometimes um, you have to try out multiple ways of of uh, processing it, of capturing it, of interpreting it, of working with it um, materially and conceptually. And I think I saw a lot of those different ways operating. Like on the one hand, there's the witnessing of it. Mm -hmm. which brings you to the kind of documentarian approach, which I thought was, um, you know, very, very clear, but it's just that idea of like, how do you step back enough to give yourself a space to, to see and, and to um, try to capture in some way. But then, you know, you've got that. And I I think I'm saying some of the same things that Catherine brought up, you know, there's that, then there's this idea of like, how do I, how do I take it into what you described, Catherine, as a speculative fiction of like, how do I, how do I re-inhabit the experience um, and recast myself in a different role so that I can, um, I can capture more deeply than, you know, a, a documentary would, something that I'm, I, I feel more fully so that those images of the gas mask in the, in the, in the barren landscape, I thought was a really um, interesting, tactic uh, and an, another different one to explore. And of course, then the archivist approach of these found objects and the collections of those and then not knowing what to do with them. I just would wanna say that in some ways, uh, you know, you've got this amazing collection and I thought about the work of Dario Robletto when um, you were describing what you're doing because uh, he not only does he work in very interesting ways with processing materially um, uh, objects and and you know grinding materials and making other kinds of things out of them, but knowing that all those materials carry a history in their molecular structure, mm-hmm. and that 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 is a beginning point. And the other reason I bring up Dario is because he also. Um, 
often will keep things around him, understanding that they are so deeply embedded with their own experience and their own kind of um, animated vitality that ultimately he waits for the moment for them to speak to him, you know? So that there is that there is also a kind of, I think in the uh, witnessing and in the collecting and in the, um, the translating into uh, another form, there is also a, an opportunity for, for just sitting with that stuff and really seeing what over time it tells you. I, I liked a lot the way you spoke about um, capturing those family films and recognizing that on the one hand, you know, you might have that moment of like pain to see that they've been scarred or damaged in some way. But on the other hand, you also very beautifully spoke about how this then creates this idea of like a, a moment of the past meeting the impact of the present, mm -hmm. you know? So again, that's a kind of dialogue of like the fire speaking to the film, the film talking back to the fire and you end up with something like a Stan Brackage kind of visual effect, you know? So there's a lot of, um, of, of uh, willingness to understand the, that the materials also carry memory. And there, there's a sort of tuning in that you have the capacity to do. So I thought all of these experiments um, that you're putting forward in the work are, are absolutely the right impulse, not to try to control it or, or make it too singular because it's such a deep and um, layered uh, personal. And then also as you're talking about a collective experience. So I, I just appreciated that. And I wanna just kind of applaud um, the willingness to allow multiple things mm -hmm. to be present at once. Yeah. Well said, well said, thank you. Thank you both, thank you Lulu, thank you Lydia and Catherine. Let's move on, Kira's our last presenter. Hi, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Great, is that all seen? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, hold on one second, I lost my notes. Okay. Do you have them? Yes, got it all set. Okay, good. Cool, well, thanks everyone for um, making it to the end. Really appreciate that. And congratulations to Shanti, Megan, uh, Sarah Jane, and Lulu on their presentations. They were really fantastic and a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, my name is Kira Teal Helfrich. Um, I'm a sculpture major and a jewelry metal arts major. And I would like to share my work with you. Um, been, and my project is I'm Not Okay. Stuck in dissonance between what inhibits us and our desire to be unapologetically ourselves can be very isolating. For some, that dissonance offers a place of safety and reflection in our time of need. That place can also be a cage that becomes hard to escape without knowing how to take it off. I create pieces for specific areas of the body where anxiety and self-hate form. These introspective representations harness the power of intrusive obsessions to transform our perception of self. The materials hold personal history, representing the confined and restricted emotions, which are then repurposed into wearable items. The final pieces unravel the source of frustrations, then transform them into extensions of the body. Each piece is an exploration on how we wear masks to process the outside world. Thin black lines with the metal, of the metal engulf our solace, pulling silently on the skin as they obstruct moments of flickering clarity. We wear the weight of our worry, looking for resolve in the softness of our aesthetic prison. So I've always been interested in making work for the body, specifically pieces that can embolden the wearer Jewelry has very much began this exploration for me. Jewelry offers, or jewelry has always been worn as a way to enhance the wearer, 
a way to show wealth, a way to emit pleasing aromas through perfume or uh, spices, even to hold poison in case of threat in the form of uh, poison rings. My work has always relied on the symbiotic relationship to the body and acting with a sense of protection with the, nat with the natural form. By integrating jewelry making techniques with textile processes, including sewing and fabric dyeing, raw edges create a textile experience. My process accentuates the handmade by fabricating cold connections in metal and using large stitches with thread. Another one of my works titled Body Farm. Even off the body, my work continues to inform ideas of the cages we wear. I'm drawn to the honest and real, to unfolding the truths behind our perceived reality. By examining the relationship to my own body, I dive into many universal expectations on the female form and the reality that it is not so easily witnessed, but felt and shared as by many. The female form and all that goes with it is in this cage that contains everything that makes so much more than just a shape. A lamp holds up the form, an internal heat, a warmth that propels the whole world forward. So an artist I've been really, that have really planted the seed for pairing textiles into my jewelry work was uh, the artist Victoria May. She's a textile artist and she was a professor of mine at Cabrillo Community College in Santa Cruz uh, before I attended CCA. Uh, she pushed and inspired me to continue working with textiles while I move into the world of metal. I've always sewed and worked with fabric, but when I began exploring jewelry and metalworking, I thought there was no place for it. Although at the time I may have not been the best student, I left with a different view of textile art and how it could create cohesion in conflicting materials. Her own passion for navigating materials continues to inspire me. She uses, uh, she uses fabrics and textiles and materials as both observational and explorative, often focusing on the organic textures and shapes it creates while incorporating different perspectives from our surroundings. She also investigates contrasting materials in a lot of her work, which is an aspect I share in mine as well. Uh, movement in space is also another aspect I'm drawn to in my own work. Sculptor Nick Cave is an American artist who uses textiles and performance to create a sound suits. These are ornate full body costumes designed to rattle and resonate with the movement of the wearer. He connects the anxieties and divisions of our time to the intimacies of the body. The sound suit removes race, gender, and class, allowing the viewer to look without bias upon these vehicles of empowerment. I am drawn to his work as he creates suits of protection that allow the wearer to be uninhibited and free from judgment. When I'm creating my own work, I locate where I feel most vulnerable and how I can address the dissonance that are in the creations that that area creates. Beginning with my new work uh, from the, for my thesis, this is the first one called Word Vomit. We find words to describe ourselves, to help with better understanding ourselves, to compartmentalize our decisions personalities, preferences, etc. Eventually, these words become confining and restricting, holding us back from being our undefined selves. In an attempt to purge these learned devices, we relearn what it is to be human. Especially this last year with the lack of social outlet, I often felt overwhelmed and, and over analyzing resulting in an outpour of words trying to be seen and in the moment, I often walk away insecure and wishing that I had slowed down my thoughts. Times like this calls for a reflection, which is peace is offered. The words pour from my mouth and reach to the ground for reflection and growth. The next piece uh, is called Mask, My Body Armor. This piece was the first in my series and was born from the negativity I experienced looking at myself in the mirror. I knew these feelings were all in my head, but I couldn't shake the lingering feeling of self-hate and doubt and wanting to hide my face. By working on this piece, it forced me to think about and process these self-sabotaging thoughts and where they came from. 
I examine how during this last year, we've had an extraordinary amount of time to stare at every aspect of our bodies that makes us human and ask why. For the exterior fabric of the head, I use my childhood blanket, the same blanket that somehow through its aging knit offered the cathartic experience of holding memory, um, repurposing into a protective covering brings the same strength and comfort it offered to me as a child. Here's my next piece of thoughts, a million different ideas buzzing through our head, light, whimsical reassurance, everyone's top 10 best ways to get started. We wear this as a weight, overwhelmed with the fear that letting go could be so easy, holding still deep breaths as we watch our life from others' eyes. This piece began as a way to rid myself of some fabric of my mother's I've been hoarding. I wanted to sew the longest tube from fabric that I could, a fabric I held a false sense of value and expectation in. Probably about 30 feet, it reached from the front door of my house to the back. Doing so, I found a sense of lightness in the process of letting go a self-perceived value. To move through a room wearing one of these pieces over the face can affect the ability to eat, think clearly, even, even hindering movement of one's own body. By working with recycled materials that already exist, I am able to repurpose their lives and rewrite memories. The next piece is nail biter. Finally, we all cope differently. Our big smiles tell lies through clenched teeth. We tear and self-groom at our bodies only to hide what we've done and feel more shame when our truth is told. Growing up, I taught myself how to knit in dark rooms, crowded places and movie theaters. I feared for my fingers. I've learned how to tuck my hand, fingers into my hands, hide them from pockets, hide them in my pockets, wore gloves as a way to hide them from judgment. Especially now, I wear my mind on my nail beds, my hands that have been the forefront to my creative practice. Often I have felt unseen and alone with what others could not notice behind my false smile and bleeding fingers. I use nylon leggings, a piece of clothing often worn by women to give an illusion of blemish free to be worn as a mask engulfing my hands. Addressing these issues of the body to others lessens the weight they carry. And I all wanted to leave you with a quote by Carl Jung as I am interested in psychology a bit, um, who look, looks outside dreams and who look insides awakes. I wanted to give a special thanks to my mother for talking me through the whole, through the tough times. Uh, my supportive partner, Nate, for helping me Push me forward. <sighs> and all of the professors that have helped and guide me toward my, my voice. Uh, Marilyn De Silva, Curtis Arima, David Cole, Deborah Valoma, uh, Taro Torim, and all my peers and classmates that have been creating and offering a shoulder along the way. And another congratulations to my fellow presenters and the rest of the graduating class. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. That was very touching. <laughs> I almost got through it without crying. <laughs> <laughs> better, better that you let yourself. Okay, so respondents, we're gonna begin with Lydia. With me, yeah, wow. Um, Kara, there is, there's really just so much to say and I really uh, appreciated um, the way in which you walked us through, uh, you know, on a very personal level, where this work came from um, and what it means to you, how it's deeply rooted in your own uh, kinds of, um, you know, anxious conditions and the way in which you've understood very deeply how that registers in your body. But I, I also um, was very struck by you talking about when you, you know, especially when you talked about the jewelry, your earlier work, um, you mentioned kind of embold, embolder, emboldening the wearer. And I think that there's something really profound about the way in which you were both willing to be so vulnerable with uh, identifying exactly where these kinds of traumas live in one's body and, and, and anxieties. Um, and also thinking about how to, um, to take those on 
to not to get rid of them necessarily, but to learn how to name them, how to manage them, how to play with them, how to transform them so that it, they go from, uh, you know, the, the monsters or the demons that you might be feeling within on a bodily level to something that um, uh, sort of removes them from your body literally and also uh, allows you to redefine your relationship with them. So I think that's like really what therapy does. So, you know, I think you've done a great job um, on that. Uh, but I also want to say that I am really struck by how, aside from the personal, um, uh, you know, sort of motivations for this and the narratives that you included us, the images themselves, once you've mm -hmm. made them, have a life of their own and all, immediately start to point to relationships um, with much bigger issues of monstrosities and monsters of our time. And so, I mean, when I was looking at them, it, I, you know, I read your thing it, when I was looking at the sort of preview of this. And then when I looked at the objects, I was a little taken aback because suddenly they were so much more than any one individual. And they started to link to the ways that monsters appear in the history of art. Um, you know, not only in the uh, Hieronymus Bosch kinds of paintings or Byzant like I, I thought a lot about Byzantine representations of hell uh, and the kinds of demons of hell, because often those are bodies that have been contorted or are carrying extra sorts of uh, burdens, literally. Uh, so if you haven't ever looked closely at those Byzantine um, hell scenes, I would really encourage you to do some. So, but I, I also thought about the word mo monsters, which is what you're kind of creating and how that, you know, the, the root of the word monstrum is also um, not only about the sort of abominations and the, the dreads that we have and the anxieties, but also how they can be, how monsters can play the role of sort of uh, nuanced, uh, you know, almost prof prophets, if you will, that, that, that they can be signs or they can be warnings of things. And so when I started to kind of see your work, I also saw that this could uh, be an opportunity to move outside of yourself and begin to think about the sources, the, the larger sources, of uh, the, the anxieties, the systems that produce those things, the, you know, the social, the political, et cetera. And that those really um, are what you're in dialogue with when you start to move into the world of the monster and think about the way in which we have to inhabit those things or carry them or manage them or transform them in some way. And um, so I think it very much invites a, a link to the politics of our time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and really thinking about the, uh, the power of those images to both uh, terrorize and also, um, again, almost uh, inspire a response. So I, I just wanted to mention that there was a really interesting um, journal, the Society for Cultural Anthropology, that did a whole uh, issue on monsters and invited all kinds of writers to think about who, what their monster was of our moment and to write about that. And I think it would be something that could be really interesting for you. But I, I, um, I, I appreciate the clarity of where these, these things come from and then the invitation to, to really begin to see them in dialogue with all these other kinds of forces that we all are uh, feeling the, the pressures of. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I definitely had a lot of uh, the same thoughts as, as Lydia. And it's actually so funny, Lydia, that you brought up the, the Bosch or like Byzantine element of the monsters. Cause um, uh, so your, your uh, ma the sculpture masked or um, the piece masked. I kept thinking, what does this remind me of? And it was actually this uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder, uh, drawing of the beekeepers where they're wearing these big long robes and they have baskets over their faces um, and like as I was thinking about those two parallels I was thinking about how 
you know, Bruegel always has some kind of like coy, uh, like a, a moral pun or something, but that one, and it's a, it's a really famous work about labor and there's uh, all kinds of, you know, political turmoil happening. <laughs> it's really similar to, uh, you know, now. Um, and it was kind of about silence. So I was thinking about how often, you know, as you allude to, we all wear masks in, in society and to kind of conceal our feelings um, and how masks have been seen as a symbol for either, you know, being silenced or being silenced or hiding something. But these masks kind of, they flip, they flip that, not just, you know, the one called mask, but I think all, all of the pieces you showed us, right? They're um, rather than it, being something about concealing it's it's showing those those elements to to everyone those anxieties and um or as you know the the monstrosities that we often want to um, um suppress and so i thought it was again a really interesting um not just tension but uh twist on this idea of like well you think you know the 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 history of mass but i'm going to uh build off of this and and give this little um, twist. So I thought that was really, um, really, really interesting. And again, thinking about, um, you know, carrying the weight and, and thinking about labor as well. Um, and again, yeah, I guess that I just found a lot of history in, in your work, you know, um, which I, I really, I really appreciated. Um, and like Lydia said, I thought the photo, the photos on their own were really really striking photos. Um, but I am a little bit curious, you know, when we get to open spaces again, you know, how would you like these pieces to be seen in, in a gallery space? That is the question of the ages at the moment. <laughs> um, I'm kind of like, I think eventually when that time comes, um, I am kind of imagining them being worn, um, having a body wearing them in a place. At the moment, I'm thinking like, dark room spotlight onto each of the pieces in order to kind of create an atmosphere. Um, and also like, you know, perhaps like introducing sound in some way to, to be like kind of like sounds of the, like the, the body might make or the a human might make and stuff wearing these pieces. Mm. Um, I kind of really want to kind of create a feeling that um, it sounds like my photography is doing, like creating kind of like this, like, I don't want to say like the terror, like the um, kind of like a, I guess I go back to the word the dissonance, like the dissonance of um, of like the softness of the image of the um, of the colors, but then like the mat, um, the topics and everything. So I'm kind of imagining like that at the moment. Um, dark room spotlights, just uh, spotlighting on the specific um, top uh, pieces. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get to see it really soon. That sounds. Uh... <laughs> Really interesting, and yeah, congratulations on this on this body of work. Thank you so much. Thank you both. That was very helpful feedback. Thank you. Yes, very helpful. So we just have a few minutes, and I would like to actually invite uh, Lydia and Catherine if you have any just general comments uh, about the presentations as a whole, any themes you might see that run through them, or. Mm. Well, I mean, they were beautiful presentations, every one of them. And I also, you know, um, feel like, you know, you, you, you thought you really gave a narrative that opened up the work to us. So I, I appreciated that, uh, you know, it, in each case, we didn't, we weren't left wondering where this work comes from or what the stakes of the work are. To, to you as artists in this moment. And I think that's a very important uh, kind of uh, uh, thing to, uh, that sometimes takes a lot of courage to claim. Um, so I wanna, I think that the level of ambition in all of these work and also the level of courage to, um, to, own, it, to own it, to uh, reveal the way in which it's evolved, um, to point to the things that are not resolved yet because mm -hmm. that's what art is it's a constant uh, kind of re remaking and iteration so i i all of those kinds of things seemed like they were coming through consistently in all of these works and they're very much um you know responses to the conditions of our time which is you know what we're here to 
<laughs> to be trying to make sense of in some way and uh, trying to offer uh, a dialogue in, you know, with those forces and those communities and those conditions. So I, I, I just think it's ambitious work and uh, very impressive actually. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, everyone's communication was, was really great. And like Lydia said, we, we weren't left wondering like where, where it came from and not only just the stakes for you as artists, but I think like larger political stakes, um, personal stakes as, as, as an audience, you know, um, or, or also addressed. So yeah, I really commend all of you on, on, on working on such uh, great communication is definitely a skill as artists that you'll need to use all of the time. Um, and yeah, I, I guess just what Lydia said, I think I'll, sometimes, um, you know, uh, so a lot as uh, that, 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 a lot of un, unresolvedness, which I think art holds so well. Um, and sometimes, you know, in my experience, young artists will be, uh, hesitant or, or, or cautious to present work that doesn't, uh, that is unresolved or that does hold tension. But I think that's just one of the things that makes art so, uh, why we come back to it uh, again and again to think through, um, you know, politically dissonant moments or or struggle. Um, so yeah, I think that that bravery to to hold tension and to uh, to bring it to the forefront and to not hide it, to not hide contradiction or anything like that, um, was really really uh, really great. So again, yeah, really really great job, everyone, and congratulations on all of your bodies of work. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Lydia and Catherine, for all the very astute reflections and the wise words. And I know that they were meaningful to all of my students. And I have um, for, for Shanti, Megan, Sarah, Jane, Lulu, and Kira, very specifically to you. You all did a magnificent job today. Um, and working through the semester and refining your ideas and following your inquiries, making the work itself, learning how to speak about the work, how to write about the work and putting together really compelling presentations. So I wanna congratulate each one of you, um, especially in these difficult times. And I just wanna let you know that I am personally proud. I was teary the entire time. So um, thank you for all doing a good job. And I want to thank everybody who came and participated, uh, family and friends and other faculty member and students. So I would like to just close by everybody turning on your camera if you feel comfortable doing so, turning on your um, uh, the uh, recording, the um, sound. And let's just give everybody a big round of applause and congratulations. Okay, thank you, everybody. Congratulations. Congratulations. And presenters, can you stay with me for a minute? Sure, happily. So, yeah, presenters and uh, respondents, please, just for a minute, we'll just wrap up together mm -hmm. for a moment. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely day. <laughs>